So hello, hi everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I'm very pleased to have you here. Uh, let's wait a couple of minutes uh, uh, that uh, all the people who subscribe the webinar join. Uh, my name is Nicola Cellini, and uh, today I will try to introduce you to this uh, uh, topic in Gearbox 4.0. And I would like to share some of my past experience regarding uh, the Gearbox industry and also how to exploit the new uh, 4.0 technologies in this uh, traditional uh, sector. In fact, according to my experience, uh, Gearbox manufacturing uh, is, uh, uh, is based on traditional approaches, uh, both in design and uh, manufacturing and assembly, uh, where uh, all these steps are not all um, I say uh, manufacturing processes are uh, uh, include uh, different uh, machining, uh, special processes, and the final assembly it takes a lot of time. So uh, I think uh, that new technologies nowadays are uh, are able to reduce uh, uh, lead time, uh, time to market, increase quality, reduce costs. Uh, which enable, uh, which will enable uh, higher competitiveness. So we have almost all our attendants uh, joining. So let's get started. If you have any question at the end of the uh, session, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, so if you have any question, please feel free to write your question in, in the chat and we will reply at the end. Or uh, you can also unmute yourself and ask the question directly. So for people who don't know me yet, uh, my name is Nicola Cialini. I have a, a, I'm an aerospace engineer. And uh, after some years of experience in Italy and in Germany, uh, currently I'm living in Spain. Uh, as I said, I have more than 10 years uh, in the gear manufacturing industry, uh, in the, especially in the aerospace business. Uh, I worked uh, for about seven years in Italy and later on about five years in Germany and currently I'm working uh, for, I've been working for two years in Spain. Uh, my past experience is mainly based in the process improvement, uh, new product introduction, implementation of new line and implementation of an assembly facilities in Germany. This is where basically I collected all my experience and especially in the, my experience in Germany, I, I, uh, I became uh, more interested in uh, uh, Industry 4.0. So this is the question we will try to, uh, to, to answer today. How can Industry 4.0 embrace gear, the gearbox manufacturing industry? And uh, there are a lot, several ways to do that. Uh, but uh, today we will try to uh, um, to see, to show you, I will try to show you uh, 20 ways how to exploit these technologies. Uh, for people who are not very, uh, really familiar with the uh, Industry 4.0, Industry 4.0 became public in 2011 in Germany, and the goal was to revamp the uh, German manufacturing sector. And uh, uh, the, the founder, the developers of this concept, they found, uh, uh, according to the Boston Consulting Group, uh, nine key technologies to be developed. And of course, one of these technologies is additive manufacturing. Then we have Internet of Things, so the connection of cyber physical systems, uh, autonomous robots, which includes uh, collaborative robots, also known as cobots. Uh, and automated guided vehicles, also known as AGVs, big data analytics, uh, simulations, and we will see some examples in this presentation, uh, augmented and virtual reality, uh, horizontal and vertical IT system integration, cybersecurity, of course, because if we are going to share a huge amount of data, uh, everything will be uh, managed digitally, we must be sure that our data are safe. And of course, cloud computing. Cloud computing, of course, is an enable of sharing data through Internet of Things. So in the next slides, I will show you uh, 20 examples on how you can introduce, practical examples on how you can introduce 
uh, industry, uh, these technologies uh, in your uh, uh, design process, but also especially in your manufacturing and assembly process. Uh, the first technology, which is not really a technology, is more an approach, a methodology, is called digital thread. So digi with digital thread, this basically means to how to, to exploit uh, uh, digital solutions throughout the entire uh, life cycle uh, process. So do, during the life cycle management of a product, which means practically during the uh, concept and design phase using a model-based definition. And in the next slide, we are going to explain what a model-based definition is, but also to use digital solutions in the manufacturing environment, for example, uh, through process simulations, or, but not only. And the same as assembly, we can, we should try to exploit these new technologies uh, to help the assembly process. But of course, the collection of data uh, throughout the entire uh, the, the entire life cycle of a product will enable will uh, enhance uh, quality uh, through uh, artificial intelligence. We are able to uh, analyze data almost in real time. We can also collect data on the field, so we are able then to analyze what what is happening and, and uh, in service, and then we can also in this in this way optimize our product and therefore other our process, and we will be able to enable or to improve our customer support because uh, we will implement a data driven uh, decision making approach. Uh, the second point, the second way to uh, how to exploit industry 4.0 is uh, using model-based definition. Uh, I don't know, maybe some of you guys are already familiar with this concept, but basically it consists of a, a 3D CAD models, uh, which include information, uh, basically uh, information like uh, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. But also we can include all information like materials, specifications, and uh, uh, the level B of materials in the CAD model. So we don't need uh, uh, any draft anymore, but everything will be included in a 3D model. So as you can see here in the example, um, all the dimensions, all the critical, all the, all the dimension, all the information are stored are stored in the in, in the 3D models, and so in this in this way we are going we we will uh, introduce uh, uh, more uh, intelligent 3D models. So some of people, especially also um, myself, when I started to to see it, this this concept, I didn't realize uh, the importance. I didn't think that this was just uh, uh, really uh, an important tool. But uh, later on, I tried to identify and together with some experts, we identify what are the main benefits. What are the main benefits in using such an approach? Well, there are uh, one of the key, uh, for me, the main benefit is tolerance take up, which means computer added tolerancing. So if you have 3D models with all the information included, it's much easier to implement in solutions, uh, automated solution to analyze um, tolerances. And it's very easy to, not easy, but it's easier to, to implement a tolerance stack up, especially in, comp in a complex assembly. But also once you have a, a, a model like that, uh, you can use these, uh, these CAD models uh, together with your, um, your inspection process. So for example, with a CMM, uh, you can compare all the data you collect immediately with the models you have. So you have immediate result about the, uh, the quality of, uh, of your product. And also, of course, imagine if you have complex assemblies, uh, configuration management becomes much easier because all the information about, for example, the bill of materials, the materials inside an assembly, it's already stored in your file. And so it's a really it's a really simple and easy to uh, export all the information you need and to analyze and to create the database in a simple way. So in this way, you don't need uh, different files to track uh, um, different issues and every time, but everything is stored in one file 
can be shared easily. Uh, another uh, another uh, solution uh, using digital uh, tools is the discrete event simulation. A discrete event simulation is also called uh, DES, is a decision support tool uh, which is used to understand interaction within the simulating system. So uh, how does it look like? So with the discrete event simulation, you can uh, um, analyze uh, your entire assembly or manufacturing process and divide it in different steps. You can assign, you can uh, uh, assign different uh, uh, input to each uh, uh, sub process, sub step. And uh, in this way, you can analyze uh, what happens if my volumes increases, uh, what happens if uh, I introduce a new product in my line, which means that I can see uh, what happens uh, uh, if, uh, uh, where, where I can have bottlenecks or uh, uh, what happens if I have uh, uh, long lead time items. So you can, uh, you can analyze uh, different what if scenarios in your production process. So here, for example, you can see an output. You can analyze uh, uh, where you can see uh, bottlenecks or the efficiency, the utilization of your workforce, utilization of uh, uh, your assets, uh, overall equipment efficiency. It's basically you can identify uh, in advance uh, all the key metrics uh, related with your uh, new lines, assembly line, production line, or with uh, an the optimization process of a, of, an, of a new line, for example. So it's a very flexible tool to analyze in advance uh, criticalities. But of course, once you have a, a model like that and you are able to, uh, to create a sort of digital mock-up or your factories, nowadays all assets from suppliers are comes from uh, comes with uh, uh, 3D models most of the time. So once you implement uh, your uh, your digital uh, model, you analyze your digital layout, and you can implement a digital 3D mockup. It's very easy and it's very simple and uh, uh, effective to uh, validate your model using uh, virtual reality. Um, this is just in this picture, you can see a former colleague of mine from the Manufacturing Technology Center in the UK, uh, where he's using uh, um, virtual reality in a cave uh, developed in, uh, in MTC. However, there are much simpler and uh, cheaper solution, and maybe also from my point of view, even uh, more effective uh, using uh, uh, head mounted displays like HTC Vibes or Oculus Quest nowadays are very simple solutions and very cheap, like 1,000 euros, you can buy this device. And what the benefit is that you can really feel, you can really experience your uh, line, your production environment before you implement it. So you can uh, uh, see, for example, if the layout is according to your expectations, because sometimes when you create your layout in a, with a CAD and your computer, let's say one meter, uh, if you want to, to keep distance between two machines, for example, of two meters, two meters on a monitor is different than two meters in reality. So when you want to do really uh, this type of assessment considerations is very easy, simple and effective to use uh, virtual reality solutions but also we will see later on how we can exploit virtual reality in other ways. Multi-physics simulations. Uh, this is another, especially a very effective solution for me in the gear manufacturing industry. Uh, I don't know, uh, for people who work in the in a manufacturing environment, uh, predicting distortion or dealing with distortions uh, is, is a critical issue. Uh, because if uh, the less the distortion are, uh, the more, the higher, the, the easier is to uh, produce a good uh, gear, especially in the grinding operation, in the downstream operations. 
So uh, nowadays uh, you can uh, it's uh, you can see here in this video uh, an example of a, a heat treatment simulation, a quenching simulation. So it's not an easy uh, process, of course. It takes a lot of effort. I would say a lot, a lot of money and a lot of uh, uh, efforts uh, and resources uh, to 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 have uh, uh, consistent results from this kind of simulation. The point is that once you are able to define and to, uh, uh, to have a reliable results, uh, it's very easy to scale up uh, this solution to other parts. And uh, you can basically predict uh, uh, with high confidence level, the distortion and the residual stress inside the component, which will help you uh, massively in the downstream processes. Um, another way uh, to, uh, to, to boost our production productivity and especially flexibility is the use of multitasking machines. So traditionally, uh, the gear manufacturing industry uh, use different uh, machines, of course. So for example, if you look at the green side, the pre-heat uh, pre treatment, uh, you need to to, to turn the parts, to cut uh, the gear with hobbing or shaping or other processes. Uh, chamfering, uh, most of the time is a manual process, but of course there are also automated processes, especially in the automotive. And also sometimes you, there are like a million processes uh, to create uh, special features before a treatment. And of course uh, you need, uh, in this case, like uh, four different machines, which means a higher capex, uh, higher capex capital investment, uh, a higher, uh, more space and so on. Nowadays on the market, there are uh, what they are called uh, multitasking machines, different solutions are now available where you can basically perform all these kind of uh, machining steps in, in, one, uh, in, in one single machine. And uh, you can also integrate hobbing processes or uh, what is also now quite common uh, uh, is you can uh, use Invo mill technologies um, basically developed by Sandvik. Of course, if you consider the lead time or the, the, the cycle time, the cycle time uh, if you are going to use uh, Invo mill is, is longer for sure. But if you consider the overall process that you have just one machine, which means one single setup, uh, and you have a high product uh, product mix, product variability, I think multitasking machine is a, is a, a, a step change in the gear manufacturing industry. Of course, from my experience, if you have a, a, a low variations and a high volumes, I think having a, a, a production line with all different machines is still better. But if you're, uh, you have a high product mix and the volumes are, uh, let's say, in the, in the same time lower, I think is a, is a viable solution. Uh, rapid prototyping, uh, I think this is very uh, straightforward. Uh, most of the company, most of the companies I know already, they are using uh, simple, cheap, uh, additive manufacturing uh, 3D printers uh, to, to print uh, uh, the components in advance, which uh, has several benefits. Um, so you, you having your parts in your hand is, is, uh, is better to, if you want to understand our features, but especially if uh, you want to show critical features, for example, during the concurrent engineering phase, where you have people from with different backgrounds, it's easier to show them the a 3D printer parts rather than a model to, to, to turn in your monitor. But also it's easier to use a 3D model like that, uh, a, a, a physical model to clients or to supplier. Most of the time is uh, no, when you deal with complex parts and you want to, uh, to show your suppliers how to, uh, how to clamp, for example, uh, your fixture in your machines, it's much easier to have a physical components. But also what you can do, you can uh, print uh, the, the workpiece during the, uh, how the workpiece, workpiece looks like uh, during the different stages of your process. 
So you can uh, uh, really see uh, different criticalities, different issues uh, on different steps. And also uh, because the, the tolerances with the very cheap uh, 3D printers are quite tight, you can achieve up to uh, 50, uh, 50 microns easily with cheap, uh, cheap solutions. Basically, you can test you can test the fixtures before the, the real the first piece come to, to your shop floor. So it's a way also to save time and to reduce cost in case you need to modify fixtures or to uh, do some changes. But also with additive manufacturing nowadays, you can, uh, of course, with some it depends on the applications, but you can produce final pro final parts. This is a picture I took uh, uh, two years ago at the Paris Air Show. It's uh, an example of uh, uh, a 3D printed gear uh, uh, made by BMT uh, Aerospace in, uh, in, uh, in partnership with the uh, uh, Carpenter. You can see, as you can see, you can, uh, is a quite, if it, if it will work in the future, it's a big step change because you can reduce, especially in aerospace, you reduce the weight of components quite a lot. And basically because, and uh, you don't add cost to complexity. In additive manufacturing, we say that uh, complexity is free. If you make parts more complex, uh, the cost doesn't change. Of course, there are still some limitations. And I think it's pretty easy to understand that uh, you can produce uh, uh, power gearboxes in this way at the moment. But uh, who knows in the future if this, is, this will be maybe the, the reference technology to produce gears in the future. Uh, but also, it's, uh, it's in a more concrete way. Uh, you can exploit uh, additive manufacturing and, uh, in the uh, NPI process. So when, for example, you develop your first batch in the, in the shop floor, most of the time you have to wait uh, uh, your first part to test the fixtures, uh, for example, uh, for final inspection, the supports you create. And if you have to change it, because for several reasons, sometimes there are some modifications to implement, you need to wait for the modification in order to, to test your part. But if you, for example, you produce your fixtures in advance and you test uh, your, uh, your part with a 3D printed parts, then you can really see uh, if the, your fixture is working or not. But also you can, uh, you can design, you can produce final fixtures in this way because uh, uh, most of the time is a static uh, solution. You don't, have, uh, you don't have to support high weight and plastic uh, and poly polymers at this stage are really uh, probably the best solution. My, my experience in this sense is that we saved the more than 80% of the cost in, uh, in these kind of fixtures, but also uh, normally no, through, if you go through the design, uh, manufacturing and delivery, you have to wait uh, from let's say five to eight weeks to have the fixture done, a fixture available. If you 3D print your parts and uh, you can spend first more time in designing your solution, and then you, you spend a couple of days to print the part and if you have your 3D printer in house, you don't have any delivery time. Or if you have a, no, a 3D printer provider, we can you can spend a couple of days to deliver the part. But also, uh, as I said, you can exploit the uh, you can exploit uh, uh, rapid prototyping, for example, to test a part program for a CMM. As I said, once you have the fixture, you can test your program in a CMM, but also you can uh, create a different work pieces and you can test even your part program inside your machining process to see, to see if there are, uh, to avoid collisions. Or you can generate different type of masks. Masks are really uh, used uh, in this uh, sector no? for shot pinning to protect parts that must not be shot pinned or sand blasting, or even super finishing, but there are uh, also a mask for handling. So to avoid uh, nicks or scratches uh, during handling when you move your parts from steps to steps. But there are endless solutions 
For example, I, I, I know a company who developed some special uh, coolant nozzles to, to, to drive, let's say, the oil uh, uh, directly in, uh, uh, in all special ways to reduce, for example, the risk of burning. Or, for example, you can, uh, uh, if you need a, a soft jaws uh, for you non know, for repair, for example, you can easily 3D print all these uh, small little components, which normally takes uh, maybe some days or weeks to have. But now you can print it at home. Uh, we are almost half of our uh, path. Um, continuous improvement, of course, continuous improvement is an important. Uh, uh, area of uh, quality uh, nowadays no uh, everyone is familiar with this concept CP, cpk so the goal of continuous improvement uh, is to reduce the cpk value ideally uh, bigger than uh, cpk 1.33 uh, um, and of course for this uh, um, for to achieve this goal uh, most of the companies now implement uh, statistics uh, uh, tools like uh, Six Sigma to analyze data, to identify correlations, to identify root, the root cause and to, to implement changes. Uh, if uh, uh, some of you guys have experience with this approach, it's uh, for me is a very effective and reliable uh, tool approach, Six Sigma. However, it takes a lot of time in collecting uh, data, first of all, and to analyze data. And most of the time you need experts or you need to have a green belt or a black belt uh, in, in your company. Uh, nowadays with the uh, new digital solutions is very easy to, uh, to collect data with the cloud, with IoT, uh, with the internet of things, uh, it's easy to collect data from, uh, uh, from machines from uh, in-process inspection, final inspections. And it's also easy, there are solutions already available on the market to analyze this data, to analyze these statistics uh, in real time, which means that you uh, uh, then uh, your system automatically identify, is able to identify the root cause of your uh, defects, for example. And then uh, you can implement uh, process monitoring, which means statistical process control. So you can create your control chart automatically collecting all this data. So continuous improvements uh, may benefit massively from new digital technologies. Predictive and prescriptive maintenance. Uh, of course, uh, it's very, uh, it's important for our production system uh, not to have uh, uh, dead times. So, which means that we should avoid as much as possible to uh, maintain machine, to stop a machine to maintain. There are different uh, uh, maintenance approaches. The, the lowest one is reactive. So we fix when it breaks and or uh, preventive. So it's uh, you, you schedule your maintenance activities in order to that the machine doesn't break. Or what is more intelligent nowadays is to predict exactly when it will break and maintain it accordingly. Or even more uh, prescriptive maintenance, which means let the machines help you to decide when to avoid predictive failures. And uh, for these two approaches, you need basically sensors connected to the machines. You need to collect data and you need to analyze this data. And of course, you can have different level of analysis up to artificial intelligence like machine learning or deep learning. And once again, uh, all these, um, these uh, solutions can be must enable, uh, must, must use uh, data collections. So the cloud and IoT are an easy tool to an easy way to collect data and to have to analyze data again and also uh, you can monitor your, uh, uh, your machines with the cloud and the IoT solutions. Once your uh, production system works well and it's uh, perfectly balanced, let's say, um, 
Well, you can uh, reduce your costs by uh, using uh, automated guided vehicles, uh, which can be used to move your parts uh, from, from uh, uh, station to station. And imagine integrated with a Kanban, electronic Kanban, you can implement a full automated electronic Kanban system. Nowadays, also there are electronic Kanban software available on the market. But also in terms of costs, uh, if you look at this chart provided by an Italian company called Endeva, you can compare the cost of ownership of uh, uh, five AGVs. Let's say there are, of course, when you need to, uh, to buy AGVs, you need to know that there are different ways of navigation, different types of AGVs. Uh, so there are six types of uh, AGVs in terms of navigation systems. But if you compare with the, with the, the, the easiest one, the simple one, which is uh, uh, the, uh, you need basically a, a line, a, a stripe on your floor, on your ground to, to be followed from by the, the AGVs. If you compare these simple AGVs uh, and you compare the, the cost of having two forklifts, it's easy to see that, of course, uh, um, AGVs at the beginning are more expensive to be implemented. The hardware is more expensive. You need to program them. You need to maintain them. But once you implement the system, uh, your recording cost, uh, you don't have recording costs because you don't have to pay uh, workers uh, to, to use the work lists. So uh, in total, uh, in five years time, using forklifts is more expensive than using AGVs. Of course, the problem is that uh, AGVs are uh, not as flexible as uh, uh, forklift trucks, but in some situations when you, ha you have a high level of standardization, uh, it's uh, probably is more convenient to implement AGVs. Uh, before we mentioned the importance of having uh, multi-physics simulations uh, to predict, uh, for example, distortions uh, of, your, um, of your parts after retreatment, after quenching. And uh, a good way to, to provide the good inputs to the, to the simulation is to collect uh, uh, real data, of course, of your quenching process, for example, but also your distortion. So to validate uh, your model is important to have a real, a good, uh, a good uh, measurement system to measure all your distortion. The point is that if you use standard GMM, uh, it takes a lot of time and most of the time you have just a partial output. So because it's a, a probing system, uh, you can't have, uh, uh, unless you spend a lot of time to touch basically all the features of a gear to have a, a 3D um, replica, 3D representation of your parts after retreatment. However, uh, nowadays, um, optical solutions are becoming more uh, viable uh, in terms of accuracy. Of course, uh, I think according to my experience, it's still not feasible to, to check uh, gears at the final inspection because the accuracy of the system is not uh, as high as the GMM or CMM. However, the accuracy achieved is enough to predict distortion, to not to predict, to, to check distortions uh, after retreatments in uh, a couple of minutes, maybe, depends on how complex is your parts. Uh, and then at the end, you collect, the point is also you collect a huge amount of data. So you need to be able to manage this data, to store this data. And so you have to accommodate uh, this data and to arrange uh, your uh, IT infrastructure accordingly to collect this amount of data. But in this way, you can basically overlap your uh, cloud, uh, uh, plot points cloud, uh, your 3D models uh, after retreatment and 3D models, uh, the nominal 3D models and see where the distortion are to implement, uh, uh, to implement uh, uh, corrective actions. If you now go to assembly, uh, assembly uh, in gear manufacturing is a typical manual approach. It's, it's done manually uh, because, because uh, of course, it's, uh, it's easier and, and uh, to, uh, to train people. There are a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, critical process involved, like meshing. But as you can see in the video, uh, 
Now with cobots, with cobots you can uh, uh, enable uh, a higher level of uh, automation inside the assembly. For example, in my past experience in Germany, we were planning to introduce uh, some cobots for some assembly operation. Uh, for example, uh, when you have to install journal bearings uh, or you have to mesh gears, uh, sometimes, is, especially when you have heavy gears, and it's uh, the probability to have some uh, scratches or uh, nicks is higher. So our robots with the inter integrated cameras, for example, or some sensors can help uh, to reduce defects or also to automate the process itself. So cobots nowadays are also a feasible, a viable solution for assembling gear in this, the gear manufacturing industry. Uh, another another uh, idea is deals with mistake proofing. Mistake proofing, so for example, in, in a machine setup or in assembly. For example, if you have to use a torque wrench, uh, it, the best way would be to track, uh, the best thing to do would be to track the, the torque, the angle, and also the sequence you are, you are using when you are tightening bolts, for example, in a flange, in a, in a machine, or for example, when you are tightening uh, ring gears or flanges, uh, your machines. So there are easy smart torque wrenches, which are basically are doing what you need you collect the data, so you store the data, so also for quality, uh, you, you need to store all these values. But also what you can do with a uh, sort of a, a real, tra real tracking location, location, location system, locating system, you can track the position of your uh, smart tool in order that uh, you know exactly which sequence has been followed. Or there are other, uh, there are other uh, applications like uh, with pro laser projectors. Uh, this is a solution that, for example, is used in a gearbox assembly in Ducati. You can see some videos on YouTube. Uh, with the laser projection, uh, you can help workers to, uh, to follow or the instructions. Or for example, you can project the torque value they have to use or which uh, bolt they have to, to tighten or uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, features they should avoid or, or they should uh, say uh, work on. Asset tracking. Uh, I don't know if you work in a big, uh, in big shop, uh, shop floors. Sometimes in my, my experience it happens uh, that we, parts got lost. Parts got lost. Uh, imagine, for example, uh, some uh, expensive tools if, or fixtures. If you need to repair fixtures, sometimes if you look at your ERP or MES, uh, you parts uh, are supposed to be in a place. But when you go there, you don't find them. Uh, so apparently, this is a common problem uh, in industry, and uh, there are a lot of companies now are providing. Uh, real-time locating system solutions with different uh, uh, technologies, Bluetooth rather than wireless. And uh, basically what you can do, you can uh, track in real time the position of your batch, for example, or your components or your assets, uh, your tools uh, in the shop floor in real time. So you can uh, locate uh, your, your parts immediately. It's very useful for, for useful, for example, to manage a warehouse when you have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, items. Uh, with this solution, is a very easy and quite uh, uh, cheap to to implement. I would say. Um, workforce, of course, uh, uh, in a smart factory, the level of automation will be uh, pretty high. However, uh, there will still be uh, workers uh, working around. And uh, with simulations, you can now simulate uh, ergonomics. So there are special softwares. In, in this case, you see Jack uh, provided by Siemens, which is able to simulate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the effort that uh, a worker uh, should put uh, or how the, his position in his work uh, workstation 
uh, how the workstation impact on his health. You can analyze the, the, the problems they can they could have at their shoulders, their back, their knees, and then take uh, corrective actions. For example, you can create, uh, identify, develop adaptable uh, benches. So you can, for example, with the QR codes or with an um, RFIDs, you can set the tables according to the uh, workers' height, height, for example. Or what you can do, you can uh, uh, decide to provide uh, workers with uh, uh, exoskeletons. Exoskeletons are other uh, solutions to uh, release stress from the uh, body uh, to help uh, workers to uh, work in always in, the, in different uh, working conditions. So these tools are nowadays beca are becoming more popular. First, because you improve also productivity because people work better. And also you improve people's health and you reduce probably the, uh, the, the, the sick time. So the, the time that people are off because they are sick. Uh, but of course, workers will benefit massively uh, with uh, solutions like uh, paper, paperless work instructions. So on the market, there are even here a lot of different solutions to, provide, to implement and to create a work instruction in a more effective way. So here, for example, you can see uh, you can implement, uh, you can add pictures. And most of the time, for example, to how to, uh, to teach people how to use a sort of work instruction, how to use a machine, uh, you can uh, uh, identify, you can uh, create uh, uh, instruction very easily, but also you can implement videos, especially in assembly videos are probably the, the best way to teach people how to perform an operation. So with this uh, digital work instruction, you can implement videos, you can uh, record uh, the, uh, the instruction on the first piece, and then, uh, or also you can use them for for training, how to teach people, how to train, uh, to, to train people how to uh, to do some uh, activities. But also, uh, if you follow step by step, you need also to uh, sometimes to collect some data. And here you need uh, some yeah, special uh, fields enabled to to collect data and then to analyze data automatically. You can also analyze, uh, uh, check uh, when people uh, finish an operation and start another, what's the, the cycle time of uh, each manual operation. So you can track automatically uh, all these kind of parameters. And uh, in assembly, imagine uh, you can use digital work instruction uh, together with wearables like smartphones or tablets, or even uh, uh, it will say in the next chart, um, smart glasses. So, um, for example, ZF, I don't know, it's, it's uh, the, probably the biggest uh, uh, company producing gears for automotive, is implementing on some of their plants uh, HoloLens solutions. HoloLens is a Microsoft uh, smart glass to display uh, by, uh, um, there are different applications, but in this example, the worker is, is displaying uh, the, the work instructions directly on their uh, glasses, which means that they, their hands are free, which means imagine for, a, for a assembly or for setting up operation uh, to set up a machine is easy to, to visualize uh, work instruction with, with your hands free. And uh, my last uh, uh, tips on how to exploit uh, uh, new technologies in the gear industry is using virtual training. So in one of the first slides, we saw how to exploit uh, uh, virtual reality to, as a validation tool to validate, uh, for example, a new layout, uh, a new production line, or to optimize a new production line. However, virtual reality is also an effective tool to train people, uh, the workforce. For example, imagine you have a gearbox to assemble. And normally what you do is you have to assemble the gearbox once uh, all the parts are in place, which means that uh, uh, you need to, to wait uh, sometimes quite a lot before training people. But also <clears throat> it means that the learning core on the, when you assemble the first gears, gearbox, it will take a lot of time, maybe weeks, maybe months. 
maybe 90% of the time you, you, will, uh, you will lose in assembly, in, in, in production. However, if you implement a digital uh, replica of uh, your gearbox, uh, you can uh, increase, improve the learning core or your workforce uh, quickly and much earlier than the, 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 all the parts arrived in place in the assembly area. So you can dedicate, for example, uh, a small room in your company to train people, for example, on how to uh, set up a machine, how to assemble a special gearbox, or of course, the possibilities are endless. And the thing is that uh, uh, you, know the, you don't need a lot of people. Uh, so once you have the model in place, once you have the solution in place, the solution is there and you can ask people whenever they have uh, just a little bit of time to go there and train themselves on some operations. Uh, the, the cost of these solutions, uh, let's say, really depends on what you want to do. If you want to implement a sort of gaming uh, area where the, there is a sort of a lot of interactivity with the environment. The solution is not cheap at all. It's quite expensive. However, if you want just to uh, uh, let people uh, uh, play, uh, in, increase their learning curve, you can just, you, you should have just a 3D model of your, for example, their gearbox or your tool uh, to assemble the gearbox and then they can spend their time to try to move the parts uh, to make to be familiar with the new concept of, of a new gearbox, for example. These are just 20 uh, tips, according to my experience, how the new, new technologies can be exploited in, uh, in the gear industry. However, we, need, we should learn to face the challenge as soon as possible because it's a matter of uh, uh, competitiveness. So my tips is to, if you want to introduce uh, such technologies in your uh, company, the first step I would say I would recommend is to increase the awareness uh, of these technologies. So the first thing is to train people, to make people familiar with these technologies. Go to thread fairs. Uh, uh, there are a lot of now thread fairs. Now it's not possible to travel, but... Uh, Thread fairs for me are one of the best uh, uh, learning experience to learn such uh, technologies or to attend web seminars, uh, seminars all around, uh, also online, like what we are doing now. There are a lot of webinars available on these technologies. My second recommendation is to do some benchmarking. So you need to identify the state of the art where your competitors are. For example, if you work in automotive, it's very easy now to, to, to do some factory tours in Germany, for example, uh, BMW, Audi, Volkswagen, they are offering all uh, factory tours to people. And uh, my experience that, for example, in BMW, uh, you really feel what's, how technologies can be exploited to implement a smart and lean uh, uh, plant. Thread fairs, again, is another good way to see the state of the art of the market or create a networking. Networking is, for me is very important. Uh, networking uh, is important to, uh, now complexity is becoming uh, bigger and bigger. So no one uh, can know uh, everything. Uh, so it's very uh, important to create a, a, a good network of uh, 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 skills uh, in the industry uh, in order that you can exploit the different skills worldwide in your network. The third recommendation for you is to uh, implement a, a strategy. A strategy means to have a long-term vision of how to uh, implement where and how to implement uh, new technologies in your design department, in your manufacturing department, in your shop floors. And, uh, and then uh, what is important is to define uh, a technology roadmap, uh, a long-term technology roadmap. Uh, technology roadmapping is now becoming also an important management tool for companies to predict, to predict uh, costs and to predict uh, technologies and to have a competitive benefits over competitors. 
Last thing I would say, once you implemented your uh, roadmap, you need, you, it's not recommendable to implement uh, all your technology once in, a, in all the companies, but uh, it's better to start small, start with pilot project on some areas, key areas, critical areas. Also to, to make people in the shop floor, make people familiar with new tools, which is because change management is also a quite an important uh, um, tool to use uh, to make people more familiar with new, new things. But nevertheless, it's important to think big. Think big means that once you, you, you implemented uh, your pilot project and it works, it generates uh, high value, then you should be able to, to scale up uh, the project to different areas of, of your company. So you need to have a, a long term and a big pictures of the benefits of these new technologies. Uh, as a Cellini consulting, uh, I think uh, a training is one of the first points I mentioned. Uh, uh, for example, I'm at the moment, I'm supporting a, a couple of companies uh, in um, increasing their awareness and uh, 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 identify where some key technologies can be implemented in their business. So we developed an industry 4.0 masterclass. Uh, this is available online. Uh, which means that you can access to this platform called skills for i You go to skills for i and uh, uh, you can find the masterclass online. It's completely asynchronous. Or you, uh, normally with companies, I, uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, we, 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 we do this training with the, through webinars, different technologies and different aspects. So the key, the key points in this sense are, uh, why 4.0? What does it mean? What, what the nine key technologies are? Uh, how to implement a smart factory? What's the impact of four or industry 4.0 technologies, not only in the gear industry or in, in, the, in the industry in general, but also on our society? And uh, uh, the requirements uh, for a digital transformation and skills in demand. So these are the main uh, points that are covered in this masterclass. Or uh, another support we offer is to uh, develop a technology roadmap. So starting, we start from with uh, from the vision, requirements, and constraints of a company. Constraints like budget or um, efforts or resources that are available. Uh, and then the first thing to do is to have a walkthrough. Uh, a sort of a Gemba walk in the shop floor to identify opportunities together with the, the, the process owners. It is very important because we can't uh, uh, identify, we can't find uh, opportunities without people that know the process and the product in the factory. We support the company to identify a strategic roadmap. So which technologies to be implemented uh, and when and the effort, of course. And then uh, we support uh, companies in implementing pilot projects. As I said before, pilot project is probably the best way to start to implement such solutions in the market. Uh, that's it from my side. Uh, do you have any questions or any comments on, the, on what you saw so far? Uh, I can give you a couple of uh, sec to, to, to think if you have any questions. You can write your question in your chat or you, uh, in the chat or you can unmute your microphones. If you don't have any questions or answer, of course, maybe we'll, you will have in the future uh, some questions. Uh, feel free to contact me. Um, Illumetrix concept, uh, Guillermo, uh, can you, uh, I don't know, honestly, this con uh, sense. Yes, at the end of the day, we have a lot of information for the operators. Uh, I mean, uh, work instructions, uh, quality, uh, quality boards. Uh, is there any uh, Illumetrix uh, software that really 
really works. Uh, what do you mean? Just to, to basically to collect and to visualize sort of dashboards to to to. Uh, to I mean, to track the training and to really implement the training. For the training, you mean to train operators? Training operators into the work instructions, the quality uh, boards, and so on and so on. Yeah, on the market, uh, yes, uh, on the market, actually, uh, there are lots, lots of solution. Um, there are a lot of solution available. And, yes, but the uh, problem is, I know a lot of mm -hmm. uh, softwares. Yeah. Uh, from Excel to complex softwares, but um, sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, of course, because uh, the point is that uh, uh, my approach normally when uh, I do some technology scouting, so technology scouting is something uh, we, we, we do for companies. Uh, the first thing is to clarify the requirements. I think the first thing, uh, because if you look at the market, outside the market, there are thousands sometimes of the solutions. But the key problem is that uh, some of these people, they don't have any uh, practical or factory experience. So they develop solutions according maybe to, they are most of the time uh, uh, software developers. And uh, it's very difficult for them to provide a product that is really effective for people working in the shop floor. Um, what my recommendation would be to, 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 to track down your requirements, a list of requirements, and then perform some technology scouting uh, and uh, to and then to, to check which requirements uh, are fulfilled by which softwares on the market. Uh, if you contact me, I can, uh, I have some uh, uh, people developing special software for training. Uh, it's an Italian company, uh, but uh, I can maybe share with you this information and then you see if it's effective for you. Thanks. If it's really what you need, because now it's really, the point is that solution are outside there and uh, uh, it's difficult to find exactly what we need. And that's, I think the main problem I also see. Uh, it's sometimes like a software like SAP, MES, uh, like uh, Siemens, they provide a thousand of features, but uh, maybe companies needs maybe 20% of the features and the other 80% are not important. So it's important to find out on the market what's really we needed. So if you send me an email, uh, maybe I can try to, to give you some advice on that or some, some contacts. And uh, we have uh, Marco, uh, he said he lost his uh, the first part of the webinar. Um, Uh, parts are traced inside the, the warehouse and managed by this, uh, this software. Uh, it, uh, data, where are they uh, uh, collected? So uh, Marco, this is uh, actually, it is not uh, a software we have. Um, we, there are several solutions like that on the market. Uh, um, or I think you meant uh, uh, the real time locating systems. Um, data, according to, to the one I know, uh, are not collected inside the uh, in tag on, on Gearbox. Um, uh, data are tracked inside a special software that are uh, inside the IT uh, portfolio. But if you think, for example, data, uh, like for example, inspection data, uh, where are memorized inside tag on gear boxes? Uh, that's, I think, is a good question. So what I saw on the market, uh, for example, uh, I don't think it's a problem if I mention it. MTU Friedrichshafen, MTU is a big company producing uh, naval engines. Um, they, uh, not sure if I saw them nowadays, but I saw applications where uh, data are stored inside a tag which is on the head of a bolt inside the engine, which means that, for example, if you need to track all the data, uh, that uh, all manufacturing data, for example, uh, people just uh, can go close to the uh, to the engine and then they visualize uh, the the history of the the engine, how the all parts have been produced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, this is not a solution I I, I saw very often. 
most of the time, for example, my experience in gearbox data, well, are, are, are store in aerospace data are uh, a store uh, uh, for 20 years uh, in paper and um, are not digital, digitalized. And uh, so it's not, it's another problem that data are not digitalized. Uh, but yes, in general, data are stored inside the uh, IT, in the IT system, the company system. If you use cloud solution, uh, especially, is also sometimes is a problem because in aerospace uh, there are some different rules. Uh, you can't share data. For example, there is export control regulations uh, if you store data in the US or for American companies. Uh, so it, digital data and storage data is uh, can be an issue. Uh, if you have everything digital, and um, but yes, as you said, sometimes it can be stored in the in tag. This is would be my my idea to store data in inside tags. I hope I answered the question, Thank you. Marco. Thank you, Nicola. I hope so. I hope I answered. Otherwise, you can send me an email. We can discuss if you have any question okay. uh, on this topic. Thank um, you. Okay, we run out of time. I uh, thank you all guys for your time and I hope you enjoyed the webinar and uh, uh, I will, I wish you a good week and uh, see you on the, we see you on the next uh, webinar if you, if you will find any other interest webinar in our uh, website. Thanks Kai. And thanks Dario, thanks everyone and see you next time. Goodbye.